In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. And we are continuing our series in 1 Samuel. So you may recall that the previous chapter that we were covering, that Saul disobeyed God and Samuel essentially told Saul that well, because of this, because of your sin, that your crown and your throne are going to be taken away from you. God is going to put it to somebody that is more fit to be the king of Israel, more fit to lead his people than you are. And Saul, of course, is understandably very distraught about this. But this is how Samuel's reaction goes in, in the aftermath of those happenings. If you'll look in 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, How can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. Now, this is a really interesting scenario. Because with the exception of maybe one or two other passages, there's almost never a time where deception is actually viewed in a positive light in the Bible. First of all, is this really deception? It's definitely pretense. I, I think that you couldn't make the argument that it's not pretense. That what God instructs Samuel to do is to go and make offering. But there is pretense there. Like, he's actually going to anoint the new king, but in order to safeguard his life, God comes up with this plan, which is very reasonable, is to just take a sacrifice with you, and if anybody asks, tell them that you're going there to sacrifice to God, which is also true. He does actually engage in sacrifice. He does take the, the heifer with him to go and offer up to God. But it's just, it's really interesting to me that this is one of the very few times in Scripture where deception is painted almost in a positive light. Like, it's something that is done to protect Samuel's life here. And I don't know, it, like, it's, it's an odd story to have to deal with and to have to think about, but it does show that there are some extenuating circumstances where I think that even if it's not straight up, you know, untruthfulness, because Samuel's not untruthful here, but he is certainly sort of hiding the ball a little bit. I think that that's certainly safe to say. But I also want to point to a couple of other moral quandaries that we can pick out of this particular biblical story. First of all, Lord, the Lord and Samuel have both grieved quite a bit over Saul. We've seen this in multiple parts of the story that we've covered already, that they are upset that Saul has not turned out the way that he should have, that he has in some respects been a good king, but especially recently his behavior has not been in synchronization with the will of God. He has openly subverted God's will and rebelled against him, acting in disobedience. And it's interesting to me that as sorrowful as God is, it seems like Samuel's more so, or at the very least, it's lingering longer with Samuel. Now think about this. Who had more right to be upset at Saul? I mean, it wasn't Samuel's words that Saul disobeyed. It was God's. It wasn't Samuel's will that is subverted by Saul going rogue and doing his own thing, it's God's. It wasn't Samuel that chose Saul. God did. And so if we were to look at this sort of, you know, from the, the meta level here, sort of at the 20,000 foot level looking down at the situation, it's easy to say, well, shouldn't God be the one that's having a harder time getting over this? But it's not. 
God's the one that actually looks down to Samuel and says, how long are you going to grieve after Saul? Let's move along. You go anoint the new king. It's interesting that God's the one pushing him along and telling him to get over it. And I think that that's a pretty human thing, actually. I mean, there are times, and, and this is certainly not the only time this happens in the Scripture, there are certain times where God has to tell a person, even somebody as faithful as Samuel, even somebody that is in tune with God's will as Samuel is, being a prophet, God's literal mouthpiece, a representative for him here on earth, He's saying, okay, that's enough grieving time. Let's go ahead and move on to different things. Now, God grieves too. But he's saying at a certain point, grief is no longer appropriate. And that's something that's hard as a human being for us to pull ourselves out of. Sometimes we get so distraught over things that happen to us. We'll get so angry or upset, and it's just hard for us to move on. But God, an eternal being, he has the ultimate foresight and also the ultimate level of perception, the ultimate perspective on everything that's going on. And I think that that's one of the reasons that it's much easier for God. And maybe easy is not the right word, but it certainly gives him the perspective he needs to say, all right, now it's time to move on to something else. It's, it's time that we were no longer focused on our grief when it came to Saul, we need to start being productive again. And it's God, not Samuel, that sort of kickstarts that process, which, I mean, totally makes sense, if you understand the nature of God. But then Saul, or sorry, Samuel's immediate response to this call is, well, I can't do that. Saul will kill me. We tend to think of Saul's descent into his rebellious phase as not really being until there's that whole tiff with him and David. Of course, he does defy God no less than two times for sure before that event takes place. But we kind of think of Saul as, at the very least, a understandable and sympathetic person, even if, you know, up until the point where he's trying to actively kill David or, or wants to subvert him. But here we see Saul seemingly willing to kill Samuel to protect his throne. Now, maybe Saul would have done that, we don't know, but there's something that has convinced Samuel that Saul is willing to take his life to try to prevent him from anointing a new king. That's how much Samuel believes Saul's throne and crown means to him. And Samuel knew Saul pretty well. He was a very wise person. So if he believes this, there's a good reason for him believing that. Which means that it's probably true. It's probably a fair assessment of the situation. That Saul has so fallen victim to his own pride and his own lust for power that he is willing to kill an innocent person to protect it. You see, that's why God understood Saul is no longer fit to be king. When you have reached a level of depravity to where you will take the life of another person to protect your own self-interest, not to protect your life, not to protect the life of others, not even to protect your own safety or your family's safety, but just because you want more money, more power, more influence, there's not a whole lot that can be done at that point. God can save anybody, and I know anyone can change, but God's looking at this situation and going, this is not the person that I can have leading my people. He's just no longer fit for that task. And that's why we see the events starting to unfold as we can. And it's interesting that God makes sure that Samuel understands he's in charge of this process. The battle is the Lord's. He doesn't dismiss Samuel's concerns. He doesn't say, no, Samuel, that's crazy. I mean, you've got me on your side, and so you should just not be afraid of those things. And it's not what he does. He, he plays it clever. He plays it kind of close to the chest. And what the Lord does is he says, I'm going to be the one to pick the new king. You know that, right? I will designate who among the sons of Jesse will be my chosen to lead Israel. I'm at the center of that process, not you. 
And Samuel wasn't being, you know, presumptuous on that. He's the one that chose Saul, and he's the one that's going to choose David. I think Samuel would come to expect that, but God is essentially letting Samuel know, or, or maybe even letting the readers know, you know, several thousand years after these events take place, that God is going to be in control of this process. And that's really the core message at the middle of all of this and the, the narrative that we're about to see unfold, this drama between King Saul and King David. The core of that struggle is that God's in command regardless. God was in command when Saul was king. God is in command when David is king. And if he had wanted David to be on the throne earlier, he would have been. This is all something that God has orchestrated, that it's all according to God's plan, that he is the mastermind behind all of this. And God is instrumental in that process. And frankly, I take a great deal of comfort in that. Because especially as somebody who does the news and, and pays attention to world events on a daily basis, it's easy to get flustered. It's easy to look at this and go, ah, everything's just falling around, uh, falling down around us. It's going to be so bad. There's, there's going to be no recovery from any of this. Uh, and then God can come in and remind us, hey, I'm in control. If there is a person who is a leader in your country or there's some kind of movement going on, whatever, ultimately nothing is happening without me taking notice of it and taking proactive steps to make things go my way in the future. I mean, to the outside observer that doesn't have all this background of what God's doing to set these things up, this situation looks really, really bad. Having somebody that is willing to kill another human being to protect his power and influence in the country, having that person as the leader of your country sitting on the throne, that's a bad, bad situation. But why is it okay, and why does everything turn out all right in the end, and they actually wind up with a much better king than Saul anyway? Because God's at the core of it. Because he's the one protecting Israel. And he'll do the same thing for our country. We've had some really, really rotten leaders in the past. President, local leaders, Congress, so on and so forth. But ultimately, no matter who is in charge of the country or local town or municipality or the state, or even if America as a whole ceased to exist, ultimately God is at the core of all of that. And His will is going to be done regardless of what happens in this temporary world. Stay the course, friends. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, Woke Brigade.